Our sermon today will be taken from Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. This is God's word. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with the loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Thus says the Lord. Hi, friends. Welcome to this Lord's Day. And um, we'll begin our sermon right quick. But before we do, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ, O Lord, to die for our sins, O Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would sustain us, Lord, through all the good times and bad times, Lord, especially through these current times in which we live. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to endure, and that you would grant us the grace, O Lord, to reach out to others, to love them well, Lord, with the gospel of your Son. We ask these things, Lord, in his name. Amen. So we've been studying the book of Job, and as we discussed before, The book of Job can be characterized in the Bible as wisdom literature. And the theme of the book of Job is that of suffering. And so it teaches us very important lessons about how to suffer well as believers, how to suffer faithfully as Christians who live in a world that has fallen, a world that is sinful and sometimes very unpredictable. In chapter 1, We saw that Satan came before the Lord and accused Job of serving God for purely selfish purposes. Verse 9 of chapter 1. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. So what Satan was really saying was that the only reason that Job served God was was because it was of great benefit to him. It brought him tremendous profit and blessing from the hand of God. In other words, Job's faith was really a sham, and he was only pretending to be righteous. His service to God was not genuine at all. And it would only last as long as God continued to bless him with worldly prosperity. However, if God were to withhold his favor and blessing from Job and substitute that with affliction and suffering, Job's faith would quickly shatter and he would curse God in the midst of his grief. So the dilemma in Job chapter 1 is really a dilemma about the nature and character of saving faith. What is the essence of true and saving faith? Does true faith actually work? As Christians, will we hold fast to our faith in God even when things get hard? Well, so far in chapter 1, we've seen that Job has passed the test. He's persevered in the faith and remained faithful to God throughout the loss of all of his material wealth and even the loss of his children as well. But there's still one question that remains, however. 
one stone that has been left unturned, and that is, will Job remain faithful to God even when his very own health and personal physical well-being lie in jeopardy? How will he respond when the crushing weight of exquisite physical, mental, and emotional pain is inflicted upon his very own body? Now, with that being said, we'll examine our passage today under three headings, three headings. First, the heavenly meeting, verses one through three. Second, the earthly misery, verses four through eight. And last, the abiding message, verses nine and ten. But first, the heavenly meeting, verse one. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come from? And Satan answered and said, from going to and fro throughout the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. So, Chapter two begins with Satan doing what he always does, and that is going to and fro throughout the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And after giving a brief report of his activity on earth to God, notice once again, just like in chapter one, that it is God who first brought Job to Satan's attention, calling him a blameless and upright man who feared God and turned away from evil. Now, concerning Job's righteousness, I think it's important for us to point out that God was not saying that Job was a perfect man, a man who was himself without sin. No, that would be inconsistent with the entire teaching of the Bible. So the question is, what did God mean when he said that Job was both blameless and upright? Well, the Hebrew word for blameless is the same word that's used in the book of Proverbs for integrity. Proverbs verse 10. The bloodthirsty hate a person of integrity and seek to kill the upright. And so a blameless person in this sense would be a person whose life exhibits integrity. So in Job, as described as being blameless and upright, it is with reference to his relationship with the people of his day. In other words, Job was known amongst his contemporaries, amongst his neighbors and friends as a Christian who was also a man of integrity and all of his dealings with them. And the basis of his integrity, the very reason that he was honest and honorable in his relationships with other people, was closely connected to the fact that he feared God and he turned away from evil, that is, from doing evil to other people and treating them unfairly. So much like you and me, Job was a sinner who sincerely worshiped the Lord, loved his family, and was consistent in his walk with God. So unlike Satan, we can see very early on from God's very own declaration of Job's character and the way that he treated others, that Job's faith in God was truly genuine. That Job had a faith that worked. And this is the same kind of faith that we're told about in the book of James in the New Testament. You know, as I read the book of Job, sometimes I can't help but wonder, as a professing Christian myself, who's been redeemed by God, just like Job, what would people say about my character? How would my neighbors describe me? Would they describe me as a man of integrity? Am I blameless and upright in my dealing with those who I come into contact with on a regular basis? So much so that it's obvious to them that I'm a person who fears God and turns away from evil. And I suppose that you could ask yourself that same question as well. What would people say about your character, about the way you treat them on a regular basis as Christians? Would you be described as blameless and upright amongst your neighbors, amongst your co-workers, amongst family members and friends? I think that's a very important question for us all. And notice as well, 
that in his conversation with Satan, God fully admits to being the ultimate cause of all of Job's sufferings and misery. Look at the end of verse 3 with me. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him, Job that is, to destroy him without a reason. Again, God takes ownership for the calamities that have happened to Job. And he does not say, well, Satan, you did this. And now I have to try to fix this mess you made. I have to try to clean it up. No, we've learned from both the Bible and from our confessions that nothing happens in this world apart from God's sovereign authority and control. God acts as an absolute sovereign in ordaining whatsoever takes place in the world that he created. And therefore, we must not, as Christians, try to justify God or to defend him by saying that Satan alone was responsible for what happened to Job and that God had nothing to do with it at all. Satan is not more powerful than God, but rather, like Luther said, the devil is God's devil who can never operate apart from God's supreme authority. And notice that Satan needed permission from God in order to afflict Job and could not even go beyond the boundaries that God had established for him. But that presents us with a a very important question with regards to suffering and evil in this life. Namely, is God responsible personally for all the pain and suffering that's in the world today? Uh, This is a question that has plagued the church throughout church history. And I would say the answer is no. Now, I do admit that the answer, answer to this question is a bit more complex. And that's one of the reasons that the book of Job is 42 chapters long. But it's helpful for us to remember that when evaluating the question of evil and suffering in the world and its relationship to a good and holy God as its ultimate cause, I think it's helpful for us to distinguish between God's purpose in permitting evil to take place and Satan's purpose in carrying evil out in the world, either directly himself or indirectly through the means or actions of sinful human beings. And so Satan's purpose with reference to Job's suffering was purely evil. Satan's goal was to get Job to renounce his faith in God and to curse the very name of his creator. See, that's evil. God's purpose, however, was to display the effective power of genuine faith, saving faith, faith in the God who redeems his people from eternal destruction, which is far greater than any temporary calamity that we might suffer here on earth. So even though God afflicted Job, He did have a reason for doing so, and that was to glorify himself by displaying the power of saving faith to the watching world. And so it's important for us to remember that God is the ultimate cause of everything that takes place in this world. And though he takes no pleasure at all in human pain and suffering, he permits it to occur for wise and holy purposes. Sometimes, even when, like Job, a person has done nothing specifically wrong to deserve that suffering. Look at the end of verse 3. He, Job that is, still holds fast his integrity, God says, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Now here, God continues to declare Job's righteousness with regards to his particular suffering at this time by admitting that he himself destroyed Job without reason. What he means is that Job is not being punished for any sins that he himself committed, nor is Job receiving what he deserves as a sinner. You see, Job's sufferings from a human perspective have occurred or happened for no apparent reason. And here's where things get interesting, right? Because according to conventional wisdom, Christians who live like Job, who fear God and serve him, are faithful to him, 
they should be blessed and not destroyed. They should live lives of prosperity and not adversity. They should be filled at all times with joy rather than sorrows. You see, that's what conventional wisdom tells us. In fact, later on, we'll even see that Job's friends believed that he had done something wrong, something somehow to deserve everything that was happening to him. Even his friends believed that, his closest friends. That's why it's very important for us as Christians to remember that from a human perspective, some trials occur without reason with no traceable cause. So we must be careful when we are counseling other people, whenever we're counseling other people or whenever we're dealing with things uh, ourselves, we must be careful to uh, be sensitive to the pain of others and to never suggest that it is deserved because of some sin that they might have committed. And although sin is always present to some degree, it is certainly not always true that a person's pain and suffering is because he or she sinned. And although the reasons for suffering may not be clear to us, the book of Job makes it very clear that there is always a reason behind everything that happens in this life, behind everything that God does in his sovereignty. God's providence is never random or without a reason because God, as Romans Romans 8.28 says, works all things out for the good of those who love him, for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And ultimately, I think that's why we as Christians can endure suffering, right? Because we know that our God is a God who is in complete control and works all things after the counsel of his very own will. God is the ultimate cause of all things. So our first point, the heavenly meeting, and our second point, It's the earthly misery, Job's earthly misery. Look at verses 4 to 8 with me. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And first of all, I'd like us to notice Satan's accusation. Satan's accusation. Here, Satan denies that Job has passed the test. And therefore, his trial is not yet complete in Satan's eyes. Again, he implies that people are truly and genuinely selfish, that they will give all that they have in order to preserve their very own lives. Deep down, what Satan is saying is that people only really care about themselves. Yeah, God, you took all of Job's possessions away and even his very own children, but you did not lay a hand on Job himself. You failed to afflict his physical body. And this is the only reason why he did not curse you to your face. Now, before uh, we quickly denounce Satan as being a heretic, I think there's some truth in what he's saying. I think he, in one sense, is right. There's an element of truth to his accusation. You see, throughout church history, there have been many people who, in the midst of excruciating pain, have renounced their faith in God and abandoned the Christian religion altogether. And this is why historically Christians were fed to hungry lions and set on fire in places like Rome. So that under the threat of physical pain and suffering, they would renounce their faith in God. So there is at least an element of truth in what Satan is saying in his accusation. With this understanding, Satan once again challenges God to afflict Job only this time. He must stretch out his hand and strike Job's flesh, and then uh, Job would surely curse God. So Satan then moves from accusation to affliction. Once again, God tells Satan that Job is in his hands. However, there's a boundary over which Satan cannot pass. He must bear 
Job's life. And armed with this knowledge, Satan goes from the presence of the Lord and strikes Job with what is described as loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the very crown of his head. Now, most scholars believe that Job was afflicted with a form of leprosy known as elephantiitis or either some kind of malignant ulcer. Whatever the case, later on in the book, we learn that Job's symptoms included things like body aches, rotting bones, dark and peeling skin, worms, anorexia, fever, depression, insomnia, bad breath, failing vision, and rotting teeth. Some of those symptoms sound familiar to you guys. Friends, is it any wonder why Job's closest friends did not even recognize him? You see, the intensity of his suffering was so great that he took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it while he sat in the ashes. And this reference to ashes refers to a place outside of the city where garbage was collected and then burned. The Hebrew text says that Job sat on a dunghill outside of the city. So this is clearly a picture of alienation, rejection, and pain. Job, my friends, is in complete and utter misery. And you know, in light of Job's suffering, it's really unfortunate that they, there are today some health and prosperity teachers who teach that it's never God's will for people to suffer, for Christians to suffer, for Christians to be sick, or even in some cases to be poor. But that's simply not true. Even the New Testament reminds us that some of the most faithful saints who lived and served God through great pain and suffering all of their lives, and even the great Apostle Paul himself was given a thorn in the flesh by God so that he begged God to take it away from him. In his comments on Paul's pain and suffering, Philip Hughes says, and I quote, Is there a single servant of Jesus Christ who cannot point to some thorn in the flesh, visible or private, physical or psychological, from which he has prayed to be released, but that has been given to him by God to keep him humble and therefore fruitful. Paul's thorn in the flesh is, by its very lack of definition, a type of every Christian's thorn in the flesh. Brothers and sisters, I say this with great compassion, great comp compassion for those of you who are suffering now, even today, that pain and sickness in this life is something that, as Christians, we ought to expect. We ought not be surprised when we experience bad health. We not ought to be surprised when we suffer various types of persecution for our faith in God. We ought not even to be surprised when things don't go our way, when people speak evil of us and hate us and our friends forsake us. Remember the words of our Lord. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Well, what about Philippians chapter 1, verse 29? For it has been granted you, Christians, on behalf of Jesus Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. You see, as Christians, we are not exempt in this life from suffering. In fact, we would do well to accept the fact that suffering will probably come in our lifetime. And if there's anything that the book of Job teaches us, it's that our righteousness through faith does not mean that we will suffer any less in this life. But neither does it mean 
that God ever stops loving us, nor is he insensitive to our pain. The heavenly meeting, the earthly misery, and last, the abiding message, verses 9 through 10. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall not we receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Here we're told that Job's wife comes along with the final solution to all of her husband's problems. And ironically, the questions that she asks are the very same about Job's integrity, are the very same questions that God himself posed to Satan. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? She says, curse God and die. Now, this has caused some people to take a very negative view of Job's wife. Some claims that she was a second Eve who tempted her husband to sin. Others claim that she hated her husband and resented his righteousness. Augustine himself calls her the devil's advocate. And Calvin says that she was a tool of Satan. And while it may be true that the words of Job's wife were used by Satan as a means to tempt Job to sin, we must be careful to remember, however, that she too experienced the same loss as that of her husband. She too experienced the loss of all of her husband's property and wealth, including the pain of losing all her children as well. Now imagine how she felt now, knowing that her husband's life was now in jeopardy. Job was all she had left in the world. Can you imagine the pain that she must have felt? And so in frustration, I believe she wrongly urges Job to curse God and die. But whatever her intention may have been, Job regarded her words the very words that she said to him as foolish and not necessarily the woman herself. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. And this is why I believe that we ought to have some measure of compassion for her, for Job's wife, because in the heat of the moment, in the midst of her pain, it was her words that betrayed her and not necessarily her heart. Remember the words of Peter, in denying the Lord Jesus Christ in the heat of the moment and how he genuinely repented with tears later. Brothers and sisters, have you ever said something that you regretted in the heat of the moment? I know you have. I know that I have. But I think that's one of the lessons that we can learn from the sin of Job's wife is that no matter how hard things get in this life, true wisdom submits to the providence of God rather than trying to fight against it or even to trying to fully understand it from our own finite, finite and limited perspective. But notice how Job responds to his wife in verse 10. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? Now, unfortunately, translation in the ESV uses the word evil here in a way that implies that God is doing evil to Job in a moral sense. But that's simply not true because we know from the scriptures that God does not and cannot do evil. But the Hebrew word for evil can also mean trouble, adversity, or calamity. So Job is not saying that a person receives something that is morally good and morally evil from God. No, what Job is saying is, what he means is that just as God's people are willing to receive good things from him in this life, so also should we be willing to accept and receive the bad things like trouble, adversity, calamity that also come from God in this life. Or when trouble, calamity, or adversity comes, will we reject God when things don't go our way? when things don't go as planned. What kind of faith would that be? You see, Job's understanding of who God is 
includes the idea that God can send happiness as well as trouble, peace as well as war, blessing as well as cursing, and sickness as well as health. See, he does not believe that when bad things happen, God is nowhere to be found. What comfort would that be to us as Christians, as God's people, to think that God was far from us when we experience pain and suffering in this life? What kind of God would that be? No, on the contrary, the Bible tells us that God is very near to the suffering and to the brokenhearted. That God is very near to you and to me when we suffer in this life. As one popular theologian put it, and I quote, Right at the heart of trouble is the beating heart of God. So the abiding message of Job teaches us that both good things and bad things work together for our good as believers. And just as God continued to love Job, even in the midst of his intense pain and suffering, so also will he continue to love you who are united to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And finally, as a comfort, listen to the words of Romans chapter 8. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Father, thank you that you call us, Lord, in this life to a faith that walks, Lord, without sight. That you call us, Lord, to obey even when things are difficult, even when things are hard. May you strengthen us, O oh Lord, as we endure as, as Christians in a world that is unpredictable. May you help us, O oh Lord, to endure in a world of uncertainty. May you grant us the grace to witness to our neighbors, to be a blessing to others like Job. And may you help us, O oh Lord, to run the white race and finish well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.